All right, this then is CS50's look at cloud computing. So it's, it's hard to not to read something these days or to go online without hearing about this cloud. And so it seems to be everywhere. And yet, what is this cloud? And what is it that underlies it? Is it secure? Is it something we should be doing? And why are we doing that thing? Well, let's begin with a, a polling question. Zoom allows us to ask the whole audience a question. If you're tuning in right now via YouTube, you won't be able to participate in this part, but we'll share the results in just a moment. Who here? Has used the cloud. Brian, would you mind propping, propping up this particular prompt? And it looks like 86% of us say that we, yes, we have used the cloud. 7% mm -hmm. say no, have not used the cloud. And 7% say unsure in response to the question oh. do you use the cloud? All right. Well, thank you for participating in that. And at least for 7% or more of you, your mind's about to be blown. Yes, you have used the cloud because we are, of course, using it right now in some form. So let's actually tease this apart. Cloud or cloud computing, what exactly is this? Surely among ourselves, there's a few of us who have a pretty good understanding already of what this is. So let's take a few answers from the audience. If you wouldn't mind raising a blue virtual hand by clicking that icon, if you'd like to answer this question in your own words, in a sentence or so, what is the cloud? I'm Jennifer. I'm from Brazil. And I think a cloud is a so to keep your photos and to free up some space. To, to uh, store your photos to free up some space, did you say? Yeah. Yeah, so very well said. So storage of files is a very common use case these days for the cloud so that you don't have to store everything on your phone or on your Mac or on your PC. You can store it in the cloud, so to speak. Let's take another definition or two. What else is the cloud as you understand it now? Ayan, is it? You want to say hello and where you're from? I'm from India. So cloud is basically another computer where, I, where we store our data. Yeah, another computer where you store your data. So that's exactly right. So even though it feels like you hear about cloud all of the time, it's really just a very simple thing. And honestly, it's more of a new term than it is a technology. For decades these days, humans have been storing data on someone else's computers. Back in the day, we didn't necessarily call it the cloud. But for as long as we've had networking and the ability to connect multiple computers to one another, we have had the ability to store files and perform services on someone else's as computers. And so perhaps the simplest explanation of what cloud computing is, it's using someone else's servers or renting someone else's computers or putting your data on someone else's computers. The theme here being that there's some third party, a company, another individual, a university, or some other entity that is providing a service. And that service is cloud computing. And that service allows us end users to store our files, to check our email, uh, to have video conferencing like this one here. And so Zoom, for instance, is a cloud-based technology only insofar as we are using the internet to all communicate together. So the cloud really is just a descriptor for that primitive, using someone else's technology to solve your own problem. So let's consider a few concrete problems. The, uh, the cloud, of course, is then this abstraction. It's really more of a, a buzzword than it is a specific technology. At the end of the day, it's the internet that's making all of these applications possible. But what about this process here. And I think, Jennifer, you noted this a moment ago, using the cloud to upload your files. Well, what does that actually mean? What does it mean to be a cloud provider and provide people with these kinds of internet-based services? Well, here is a, a rack, so to speak, of computers. In fact, does anyone recognize these particular computers? They're a bit famous. And you can actually visit them in person in a museum of sorts in Mountain View, California. Would anyone like to raise a blue hand and volunteer to identify what it is we're looking at here? This is a whole bunch of computers from roughly 1999, so 20 plus years ago now. We have a volunteer here. John? Hey, how are you doing? Uh, yeah, isn't that the Google original servers or something like that? Indeed. So this is one of the first set of servers that Larry and Sergey, who founded Google after attending Stanford University years ago, apparently set up to run the very early version of Google.com. And you'll see there's lots of wires there. There's lots of logic boards or motherboards. There's lots of hard drives um, and a whole bunch of technology that's all interconnected. This is the kind of hardware that you and I are uploading our files to. This is the kind of hardware that you and I are checking our email on. Now, to be fair, this was 20 
20 years ago. So things look a little better these days and it's much more high performing. But really, at the end of the day, the cloud is just someone else's computer elsewhere, but it's a lot of computers, multiple computers, whether it's two or five or a hundred or a thousand or many more in the case of Google. These are just servers that are hosted elsewhere. So let's consider now some of the building blocks that underlie cloud. Computing and really servers themselves, which at the end of the day are what are providing us with these cloud services. So, one of the terms of art in、uh, information technology is this notion of on premise, whereby you can decide out of the gates that if you want to start a cloud based business, for instance, you're a small startup, you want to create a website, you want to create a mobile application that needs to be on the internet, you have some choices. You can use the so called cloud. Or you can actually store all of your data and all of your servers on premise. And on premise just means in your own office or maybe in your own data center or warehouse nearby. So, what does that actually involve? It typically involves buying one or more of these things. What pictured here is a, a typical Dell server. This is a so called rack server, R A C K, that's simply referring to a standard unit of measure. So, it turns out that humans long ago standardized just how big servers should be. This is really just a big PC. So, it's similar in spirit to like a tower PC you might have at home or a PC laptop that you might have on your desk. But this one just happens to be wider and longer, but not taller. The, A、uh, typical rack server is 1.5 inches tall. That's what's known as one rack unit. The upside of this design is that if you want to store a whole bunch of servers in your office or in a data、uh, center or in a warehouse, you can stack these servers in a rack, just like Larry and Sergey did early on for Google, and you can store a lot of servers in a relatively small footprint. But what are some of the problems if you are a company and you only have one server like this? If you have just one server on which you're hosting your email service or your web service or your mobile application, whatever the problem is that you're trying to solve for the world, what might be the problems that arise if you can only afford or you have only chosen to configure one such server? Any thoughts here? If you start by building your business using just one server, Alice, your thoughts? Yeah, well, if it crashes, nothing's going to work anymore. Yeah, so if it crashes, nothing's going to work anymore. Like, very well said. And there's a term of art here single point of failure, or S. POF just refers to this principle that you should generally avoid in the world of technology, especially if you're trying to run a business using this technology. A single point of failure is a bad thing because, as Alice notes, if the server dies for some reason, you lose power or anything goes wrong, your whole business, your whole service somehow goes offline. What are some other problems that might arise by having just one single server like this one here? What's another problem that might arise? Uh, Kevin, do you want to chime in here? And do tell us where you're from. Oh, sure. I'm from Wisconsin. So maybe there's not enough bandwidth on the server. So it's sort of slow for people. Yeah. So maybe you have a, a bottleneck of sorts that you don't have enough internet bandwidth because、uh, presumably one computer can only do so much at a time, just like your own Mac or PC or phone. Even if you might want to run lots of different programs at once, at some point you're going to hit some threshold where it's just no longer usable or pleasant or fast to use. So servers are the same way. At some point you're going to have some kind of bottleneck. And so this is problematic because if you have a, a very popular application, a very popular website, there's going to be some maximum number of Of users that you can handle at a given amount of time. So, on one server like this, maybe it's a thousand users at a time or whatever it is. We could actually write code or run software to benchmark a server like this. That is to try to estimate just how many users it can handle per second or per minute or some other unit of measure, but it's going to be finite. So, maybe it's a thousand users. And as you know, suppose that you now have a thousand and one customers or a thousand and two or better still, two thousand customers. We need a better solution than this. So, what might a better solution be? Well, you know what? Let's just try to scale up this server. And scalability is a theme in cloud computing. The whole goal of cloud computing, that is running servers for other people's enterprises, is to scale things so that you can handle any number of users. So, how might we do this、um, most simply? Well, let me propose that we vertically scale our server initially. So, this too is a term of art to vertically scale. Your infrastructure, or your architecture, or more simply, your servers, you kind of just throw money at the problem, so to speak. Instead of getting one thin Dell server relatively inexpensively, you know what? Let's dig a little deeper on Dell's website and buy the really big server that does a lot more. 
uh, at a given time. So instead of handing a th handling 1,000 users, maybe this bigger server is going to handle 2,000 or maybe 10,000. And bigger in this case implies that there's more RAM or memory in it, there's more uh, CPU, uh, CPUs in it or brains inside the computer, there's more hard drives to store data, there's more of everything. And moreover, there's redundancy inside of this server. You will often have two power supplies or PSUs just in case one dies. You'll have two Ethernet cables just in case one one of them dies. You'll have many more than two hard drives, so it, just in case one of them dies, and also so that you can store more data. So we can pack a lot more technology into not an inch and a half, but maybe this looks like six inches or so. They're going to be multiples of one and a half inches by, by standardization, so it's bigger with more stuff in it. But here, too, there are problems. Here, too, we're considering the scenario where we're on premise in our own office or data center. We've just scaled up to have one bigger server that will handle Kevin's concern, which is we might have a bottleneck. But we haven't solved, I think, Alice's concern. So could someone identify, to be clear, what problems remain with scalability even when we buy this bigger, faster, more performant server? What problems still remain, even though we can now handle more users at once? Uh, Yatharth, would you like to say hello and where you're from? Hi, I'm from India. Nice to meet. What do you think? What problems remain? Well, it's still one server. Uh, so it can also crash. And let's say it also has multiple G uh, CPUs and GPUs. But it still is just one thing. And if you, your premise gets uh, some natural disaster, then it would not be very beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. So Alice's concern is still in place. We solved Kevin's concern about the performance bottleneck potentially, but it's still a single point of failure. And moreover, even though we threw money at this problem, so to speak, by buying a more expensive server, there's another reality. Even if I want Dell to sell me a like 12-inch server or 24-inch server with just more stuff inside of it, honestly, at some point, that server is just not going to exist. Even if I have all the money in the world to try to solve my performance problems with my architecture, architecture, Dell doesn't have a higher end computer. And this is true in the consumer world. Even if you're fortunate enough to be able to want to get a top of the line PC or Mac, at some point there is no faster computer available. You're going to have to wait till next year or the future. And of course, that doesn't solve our problems today. So let's take a fundamentally different approach to scalability that simultaneously ensures what's called availability, or more specifically, high availability. It is a good thing if you are setting up a whole bunch of servers and you can commit to high availability. And what this does is it addresses those concerns of, of, of uh, the servers potentially going down. If we have a single point of failure, we're definitely out of luck if that server dies. So better would be than one server, of course, maybe two or maybe three. And so one way we could approach this problem is not by vertically scaling our architecture, and this is both metaphorical but also literal, getting a bigger, taller server. We can also do what's called horizontally scale our architecture. And to horizontally scale our architecture means to just get more of the lower end servers. So you might know from the consumer world, whether it's your Macs or PCs, that generally speaking, if you try to get the top of the line laptop or the top of the line desktop computer, you're generally paying even more for the top end model than you would be if you just got two of the cheaper models even. So you tend to pay a premium when Apple and, and Dell and other companies generally charge you more for the highest end computers. So it's a nicer principle and it's more economical if instead of getting one really expensive server, you know what? Let's just go ahead and get multiple cheaper servers. And this refers to horizontal scaling. And a bit paradoxically, I've not drawn it uh, on this slide horizontally because these servers at the end of the day are meant to stack top to bottom. So it's a metaphor only. But this depicts a horizontally scaled architecture. But there's a problem here. When we have three servers, we're going to somehow have to incur now some of these additional costs that still exist on premise here. So what are some of the costs now of having all the more servers? Well, unfortunately, we have more power requirements potentially. We have more air conditioning or cooling requirements. We have security requirements. After all, if we're storing these servers and in turn our business in our own office or data center or warehouse, we've got to probably keep those servers physically secure some way. So that's already three different types of costs. But even more problematic is the fact that 
having this many servers means that we also have to figure out how to wire all of these things together. And so it turns out that when we have three servers like this, but we have a lot of customers or users somewhere on the internet, we have to now decide how to solve a new problem. It's not as simple anymore as all of my users going to one specific server that has one specific IP address or domain name, if familiar with those terms. Now I've added a new problem that means I have to decide somehow how to get, whoops, <laughs> how to get all of my data into these several different servers. So that one user goes to the top one, another user goes to the bottom one, and a third user goes to the middle one, thereby spreading out the load. So these servers, therefore, all have to be interconnected somehow. And I spoiled it just a moment ago. But what often happens in situations like these, when you have lots and lots of servers, and you saw, saw a hint of this in the Google servers, is just this rat's nest, so to speak, of cables. So what you are looking at is a standard rack, which is 19 inches wide, and it's about five or six feet tall with a lot of servers in it, top to bottom, because we're trying to horizontally scale now, but they're all somehow interconnected. And there's some other hardware in there that's doing a lot of these interconnections. This is a bad situation that uh, unfortunately just tends to happen organically. You have one server, everything looks great. You have two servers, you grab the nearest green cable, you connect it, doesn't matter if it's 10 feet long, even if it's only a few inches away, it solves the problem. But if you keep doing that again and again, the situation devolves. And this photograph here is actually from um, a Reddit post on a popular website where someone explained that they had to spend hours one weekend cleaning up this mess until they could finally turn the server into something much prettier. So in the real world, a much better design when you have multiple servers looks a little something more like this. But this is only to say there's this fourth cost. It's not just power and cooling and security. It's a human cost. There needs to be some human crawling around on the floor or uh, making their way behind and in front and to the left and the right of these servers to actually wire all of these things together. And so many things can go wrong. Imagine with all of these cables, even now that they're nice and tidy, if just one of them is loose or one of them is plugged into the wrong way, you're starting to add complexity. And so thematic in computing and also cloud computing are these kinds of trade-offs. We've solved the problems earlier from Kevin and Alice of bottlenecks and single points of failure. But my god, look how complicated the setup already seems to be just based on the mere wiring of all of these technologies. And we haven't even solved the software problem. When you have three servers like these, at some point you have to decide again, what does the data go to the top, the middle, or the bottom server? You somehow have to distribute the load of all of your users. Previously, it was simple. Everyone just ends up on the same server. Now it's more complicated because something, someone, has to decide where the data ends up. So when someone is uploading their files to the cloud, does it end up on the top server, the middle server, or the bottom? When you go to download your files days later, you have to know to go back to that same server, potentially, in order to find your files. So we've added these engineering problems to solve other engineering problems. And there again is this theme of trade offs. So let's consider what we might be able to do here. So here are three rack servers, and I've removed the, uh, the arrows for just a moment because we'll draw a new picture here. And it turns out that we can solve this problem of balancing load across these other three servers by maybe introducing a fourth server. And even though I'm talking in terms of three and four, the same principles apply to 100 servers or even 1,000 servers. So let me ask the audience here, if I give you a fourth server, one extra server, what do you think we could do with that server in order to solve this load balancing problem? The goal is to figure out in a reliable way how to send data to the top, the middle, or the bottom server. And I'm going to give you a fourth server to solve this. Uh, Muskan? Would you like to say hello and where you're from and how you would approach this problem? Um, well, we could probably write some code that distributes it, that acts as a load balancer, that remembers which server the person went to, and then uh, put them back on it. Yeah, abs absolutely. And where are you from? Uh, I'm from India. India. So that's exactly right. We could write some code. We could write some software that just decides when data comes into that so top server to which other server should it be sent. Should it be sent to the top, 
the middle, or the bottom. Now, thankfully, we all don't have to write code when trying to solve these problems. We can actually just download load balancing software, or we can pay for load balancing software, or we can just buy a load balancer. A load balancer is a type of server, frankly, that's still just a PC of some sort. It's just got hard drives and memory and RAM、uh, and CPUs and so forth, but it's got software pre installed into it, much like、uh, we proposed writing. In turn, or to solve this problem. So, a load balancer is just a server whose purpose in life is to balance load. And so, in this way, might data come in from the internet, from our users. It's going to hit that server on the top. And then that server on the top is going to decide deterministically, that is, repeatedly, again and again, to send the data to the top, the middle, or the bottom server. But we do have to somehow remember. What user's data ended up on what server in this story, right? After all, if we go back to the original story, we're using the cloud to upload files. It would be really bad if you only have a 33% chance of getting your data back if by accident, the second time you connect to that cloud service, you get the other two servers instead of the one you originally connected to. So, does anyone have an idea on how we could remember in software? Where our users should end up on the top, the middle, or the bottom server? Like, what kind of ingredients can we use to solve this problem?、Uh, John, what do you think? Where, and where are you from? I'm from the UK, from England.、Um, so, I'm guessing you could probably use MAC address or IP address. And then, obviously, if the user's logging in, you could take their login details and use their login details. Nice. So, we actually have a few different options. For those unfamiliar, a MAC address or an Ethernet address tends to be a unique identifier that's built into your Mac or PC. It would tend not to be used in this particular situation because MAC addresses are typically used on local networks, so within a company, within a campus, within a home. But IP address, John mentions too, which is an Internet protocol address. An IP address is a numeric address like something dot something dot something dot something that all of our computers have. So, every laptop or desktop or phone that you are using right Now, has a so called IP address, which is this numeric, unique identifier in the world that allows data to get from your computer to Zoom or to somewhere else. And without going into more detail, sometimes IP addresses are shared on private networks, but suffice it to say, every computer for our purposes today has a unique IP address. So if when the data comes into our servers, we notice, oh, that's John's IP address, or that's Kevin's IP address, or that's Alice's IP address, you can just make sure that your load balancer has the equivalent. Of a little cheat sheet, like an Excel file, a spreadsheet that just keeps track that John should go to the top server, Kevin should go to the middle server, Alice should go to the bottom server, and we can keep track of that information for all of our other users as well. So that would seem to do the trick. And there's a third approach that John proposed. If it's an application or a service that users are logging into, well, we can probably just keep track of who they are. So this is John, this is Kevin, this is Alice. Or anyone else. And long story short, you can do that with what are called cookies.、Uh, cookies, for more on those, take CS50X itself if you haven't already. But a cookie is like this virtual hand stamp that gets put on people's computers that constantly reminds servers where、uh, that the user has been there before. So I love these solutions, and that is indeed how load balancers today solve this problem. But now there's a new problem we've introduced. Can anyone think of a problem that now arises? From John's proposal, which is to use IP addresses or people's usernames via, for instance, cookies. Have we created a new problem?、Uh, Stephen, do you want to say hello and where you're from? Hello, I'm from Ohio.、Uh, by using a device IP address, if you have multiple devices you log into your account from, you won't wind up on the same server.、Uh, it would be better to use an authentication server with a JSON web token that、uh, memorizes what server your data is actually served on. Yeah, so there's this gotcha, and I, I indirectly alluded to this when I waved my hand at IP addresses before. It turns out if you're in your home right now and you have family or friends who are also using your same internet connection by using one of those home routers or some other device, odds are you appear to have the same IP address for your computer or your phone as your sibling or your parent or your roommate or your friend or maybe your neighbor, depending on whose Wi Fi you're using. And this is problematic because, as, as you note, It might result in a lot more people 
being perceived as coming from the same IP address. So we might accidentally put every one of our users on that top server just because they happen to be coming from the same home or the same campus or the same company. So it's not quite as reliable as might be ideal. And there's other problems. What if one of those three servers goes down? If the middle server just breaks,、uh, loses power, networking issue, hard drive dies, so many things could go wrong, of course, in a computer, and that's all a server is. Well, now it's a dead end. So now John might still be able to use our service by going to the top server, and Alice can still go to the bottom one. But Kevin, if he tries to connect to my service, he's not going to reach、uh, actual data or files. He's going to reach a dead end if that middle server has died. So a load balancer also needs to be adaptive. It needs to respond to changes in the environment so that if a server dies, it can route around those problems. So we need to be a little fancier even than John proposed. So the load balancer is going to have more complexity. But there's another problem here, and I think it was Alice, in fact, that alluded to this earlier. Can anyone identify another problem with this kind of solution where we have a load balancer that is balancing load across those multiple servers? There's another problem besides just one of the three servers dying on us.、Uh, the values can get distributed, and、like, the values can be accessed by wrong device. The wrong device?、Uh, not necessarily. I think not if we implement the load balancer correctly. Let's take one other thought here on this. What problem still remains here with this solution of balancing load? Arnie, do you want to say hello and where you're from? Yeah, I'm from Belgium, currently living in the US, though.、Um, the other problem, it's still the same problem as in the beginning.、Um, if the load balancing server dies, the whole thing falls apart. Yeah, so I've reintroduced that same problem that I think Alice identified earlier a single point of failure. This is very clever in some sense because now I can spread the load across those three servers. But my God, what happens if that load balancer, that fourth server, itself dies? Now I'm really out of luck because even though I might have three very available servers that are ready to serve my application, None of my users can reach them because if this, the load balancer goes offline, it loses power, something dies, something breaks, then it doesn't matter how much I've horizontally scaled my architecture, so to speak, my users are still going to reach a dead end. So, what's the solution here? Let me call on someone else now. What's the solution? If having one load balancer is the problem, what might you say is the solution?、Uh, Ellison, is it? Would you like to say hello and where you're from? Hi,、uh, I'm Ellison. I'm from Indonesia. Um, and I think the solution is pretty much、um, identical to the horizontal、um, scaling one. So instead of、um, scaling horizontally the、um, server that stores the information, you scale horizontally the、um, server that does the distribution. Yeah, really well said. And this time I happen to come prepared with a picture that is horizontal in nature. Let me kind of shrink everything down and make room for, for Ellison's solution here. You know what's better than one load balancer? Well, two load balancers, right? If the problem is already identified, is that we have a single point of failure, the solution quite simply, intuitively, is well, don't do that. So then the harder question is, how do you avoid doing that? And as Ellison proposes, let's add a second load balancer and scale the load balancing tier, so to speak, T I E R. Let's scale the load balancing tier horizontally as well, so that now we have decreased the probability that I'm going to go offline because it would be a lot more unfortunate for two servers to go offline and hopefully a lot less probable than just one server going offline. But there's another problem, right? Now I have to literally wire these things. Things together somehow. And even though I'm doing it sort of graphically with these arrows, those are actual green cables or some kind of cables like in those、um, racks earlier that have to be somehow interconnected. And I worry there's still now a new problem we've introduced. So I like Ellison's solution here add a second load balancer or horizontally scale that tier. But you know what? How now do I decide which load balancer? Responds to users' traffic. So my users are still trying to access my website or my mobile application from the internet. So that arrow from the top is coming down. And now I need to decide does my data go to the left load balancer or to the right load balancer? And my God, if I had three load balancers or four or more, how do I even decide? So I'll, I'll get ahead of ourselves here. Well, maybe we just need a load balancer for the load balancers. 
but you can appreciate perhaps just how messy this gets quickly. If I now need a load balancer for the load balancers, that's great because it solves this problem, but I've just reintroduced the same darn problem as before. Now that one new load balancer could break and go offline. So I need two. But once I have two load balancers, my God, now I have to decide how to balance the load there. And you, it's recursion, really, if you recall the term from CS50X. There's sort of a never ending solution there. To that problem. So, fortunately, here, there's some other techniques we can use, and also we can rely on probability or statistics, really. There is only a finite probability that each of these servers is going to die, and we don't know what they are per se, but you can generally estimate. It turns out, at least in the business world or the so called enterprise world, when you buy a server or you buy hard drives for a server where files get stored, the manufacturers will often tell you what the mean time between failure is, or MTBF. And this is just an estimate. Based on their own testing, that you know what, this hard drive, if you buy it from us today, we predict that it will last three years and then it's going to die on you. Something's going to break. Now, it might break tomorrow, it might break in a year, it might break in six years, but on average, the mean time between failure is maybe three years. So once you know that this server might die for some reason every three years, and this one, and this one, and this one, you can start to do what are called back of the envelope calculations. You can start to do sort of simple math, literally, on the Back of an envelope or a piece of paper, and just kind of estimate wow, the odds that this server dies and this one and this one and this one die all in the same day is just so low that you, as a, a webmaster, you as a business person, just don't need to care about it because it's way too expensive to try having, for instance, an infinite number of servers to solve that problem instead. So at some point, you just rely on probabilities. Yes, my whole server can go down, my whole rather infrastructure can go down, but there's like a 0.0001% of that happening, and it might cost Me a million dollars to decrease it further, at some point you just have to decide this is good enough. And this is why the Facebooks and the Googles and the other big companies in the world, no matter how big and how famous and how wealthy they are, even their servers go down sometimes because they have made a conscious decision to play these probabilities. But sometimes life happens and there are hurricanes or other natural disasters or there's human errors that result in servers going offline or breaking in ways. That weren't anticipated. But at least to solve this specific load balancing problem, I think we need one more arrow. I would propose that these two load balancers at least talk to one another. So it's not really necessary, at least in the story we're telling now, for each of our individual servers to talk to one another. It suffices for the load balancer only to talk to them, to send data from the internet to one of those three servers. But you know what? We can avoid having load balancers for load balancers for load balancers by at least having the two load balancers Ellison proposed. Talk to one another. And so, what generally happens in the real world here is that when data comes in from the internet, from your users, and it reaches those two load balancers, one of them is the primary load balancer. It by default is going to be the load balancer that listens for traffic and routes it to the top, the middle, the bottom server. The second load balancer, the secondary server, is just going to sit there doing nothing except. Talk to the other load balancer. And the term of art here is heartbeat. So, a common primitive in software programming is to actually have one server send a heartbeat to another server, which is the equivalent of a human heartbeat saying, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. So, if the primary load balancer is saying, I'm alive every second or so to the secondary, and the secondary is also sending that message to the primary, they will know within one second if the other server has broken in some way. And what load balancers are designed to do is when the primary load balancer stops sending a heartbeat because it lost power or the hard drive died or something else went wrong, the secondary load balancer is configured in advance to assume that, oh, wow, if I don't hear that primary load balancer's heartbeat anymore, I should presume that I am now in charge and the secondary should become the primary and it promotes itself, so to speak. So, so long as you code this in advance or you buy the software or the hardware that knows how to do this in advance, you can have one take over for the other. But there's still challenges here because what if you have more users than the load balancer itself can handle? You might need to vertically scale your load balancers or you might need three or four horizontally scaled. So, those same problems still exist. But there are ways to avoid just buying again load balancers for load balancers for load balancers. So, suffice it to say, 
this is just frightening. Like, there's so much complexity here, not just at the hardware level with all of those darn wires, there's just a lot of fancy software that's involved. That thankfully you and I don't necessarily have to write. We can download open source versions of this. We can pay for commercial software that solves load balancing problems. But this is just a big distraction, right? If you're trying to start your own website or you're trying to start your own mobile application, odds are you care about your website. Odds are you care about your mobile application. You don't care about load balancers and heartbeats and, and all of these lower level implementation details, so to speak. And that's unfortunate because someone's got to wire those servers together. Someone has got to install the load balancing software. Someone has got to、uh, sleep with a cell phone next to them so that if something breaks, they wake up in the middle of the night and go fix that. And so for many years, when everything was done on premise, so to speak, whereby you just had Your own humans, maybe yourself or some colleagues,、uh, running things in your office or your data center. Nowadays, wonderfully, you can outsource all of these lower level implementation details. And so, when we began today's discussion describing cloud computing as someone else's servers, that's true, but more to the point, it's someone else's problem. It's someone else. It's Amazon or Microsoft or Google or a lot of other companies out there that are so called cloud providers who are providing you not just with hardware, not just with CPU access, not just with disk space to store files. They're providing you really with human services and a lot of proprietary software that automates a lot of this complexity so that you don't have to crawl around on the floor wiring computers together, so that you don't have to balance load, and so that you, if for instance your business is booming around the holidays, or maybe you get blogged about, or you get some really good press. My God, consider that being a wonderful situation to get all of this good press, and you've got a lot of new customers interested in visiting your website or your application, but uh oh, You don't have enough servers to handle that. But thankfully, bigger companies like Google and Microsoft and Amazon do. And so, one of the key features of cloud computing is that it's much easier for you and I and smaller companies more generally to scale. Automatically or sort of magically, even because so long as someone else already has the servers in place, so long as someone else has already wired them together, so long as someone else has already connected the load balancers, if you happen to get some really good press and a lot of people want to download your application or visit your website, that's okay because you can click a button in a web browser and say, Give me four servers today instead of three, or give me 300 servers today instead of three. And that is to say that cloud computing too has benefited from what we'd call virtualization. And I'm going to go and propose that virtualization is actually something you might be familiar with already, at least if you've taken CS50、uh, X itself. Many of you might have used CS50 IDE, maybe years ago, CS50's appliance. Both of those technologies actually relied on virtualization being an available technology. So, what does virtualization mean and how does it enable? And really facilitate cloud computing? Well, here's a picture, and this is from a company called Docker that、uh, creates an alternative technology that we'll introduce in just a moment. And this picture here essentially abstracts away today's discussion as follows. Down at the bottom in green, you have、uh, infrastructure. So that's your physical hardware, your Macs, your PCs, whatever the physical hardware is. What virtual machines are and virtualization does for you is it's special software. You might have heard of VMware or Parallels or VirtualBox or other brand names. These are technically called hypervisors or virtual machine monitors, which is to say, humans have written some special software that you run on top of your infrastructure, on top of your Macs and PCs. But what's amazing about hypervisors is that they allow you to install multiple operating systems on the same physical computer. So instead of having one PC and one copy of Windows, you instead have one PC and three copies of Windows installed on the same computer. Now, that's a little wasteful because we're installing the thing three times, and that is a price we will pay. But you now have the ability to take one big server, your infrastructure, Run this hypervisor software on it, and now guess what? You have the illusion of three virtual servers. And if you're in the business of cloud computing, this is pretty amazing because it means you can buy one server and sell it or rent it really to three other people. 
And so cloud computing is typically characterized really by this feature, the ability to take very high-end expensive servers that have lots of hard drives, lots of CPUs, lots of RAM, but chop them up virtually using software known as a hypervisor to create the illusion that you have your own server in the cloud, that I have my own server in the cloud, that other people have their own servers in the cloud. And because these are separate installations of Windows or Linux or some other operating system, we can each have our own administrator uh, usernames and passwords. You can't get into my virtual machine, and I can't get into yours. So you get to use the latest and greatest hardware, but for multiple customers. And this is a good thing, too, because consider you might be familiar generally with Moore's Law, which is this principle espoused years ago that computers roughly double in speed and capacity uh, every couple of years or every 18 months or every year. It depends on how you look at the world. But because it suffice it to say that computers are getting faster and they we're getting more and more features every passing year. You and I, frankly, are not getting any faster at using computers. You and I can only write documents so fast. You and I can only check our email or send text messages so fast. So we humans are the bottleneck. So we have these incredibly sophisticated high-end servers these days, but we don't necessarily have as individual users much use for that much computational power. Even though these things are tiny now, relatively speaking, you can pack so much computing power into just one and a half inches, or three inches, or six inches, or whatever the case might be. Virtualization allows us to make much more efficient use of that computing power in the same physical footprint without necessarily needing that much more power or cooling or physical or space or security. We can do more with individual servers. So the cloud really caught on when people realized that we can harness this technology of virtualization to chop up our physical servers into multiple virtual ones. And so back in the day, if you ever used CS50's appliance, you literally downloaded a virtual machine called the CS50 Appliance, and you probably downloaded software called VMware or VirtualBox or Parallels or something else. You installed that, the hypervisor, on your Mac or PC, and you ran the appliance on top of that. Now, CS50 uses virtualization for all of our servers. We happen to run most of our services on AWS or Amazon's cloud, which is to say that they are the ones who buy the servers, run the servers, plug the servers in together, and handle all of the load balancing and more. But we also use these days a technology called containerization, which is kind of sort of a lighter weight version of virtualization. That's an oversimplification, but the picture is a little different. In the world of containers, which CS50 uses, and specifically CS50's IDE now uses, you still have your infrastructure, the green box here in the picture. You then have one operating system installed. We'd use Linux, uh, Ubuntu specifically. And then on top of that, you run special software. It happens to be called Docker. And that software allows you now to install multiple applications on the same single operating system. But each of those applications is what we would call sandboxed. Not to be confused with CS50 sandbox, but there's a reason it's called that. Sandboxing these applications means that application A can't talk to B or can't talk to C and can't access the data among these various applications, which means you can use the same physical server but chop it up for many different websites, many different databases, many different applications on the server. So containerization is very much a technology, too, that all of the cloud providers, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and smaller companies out there are increasingly using so that they have lots and lots of servers, but they can have even more customers. But there's a question, ultimately, that arises. When you have all of these servers, and the goal is not only scalability, but availability, keeping these servers alive, how can we go about measuring this? So there's one other term of art here I thought I'd go back to, which is this, uptime. Uptime just refers to how much time is your server or your servers up. And how could we go about measuring our uptime? Well, a very common approach is just to keep track of, well, what percent of the time does your website or your mobile application work? You know, it'd be great if your mobile app or your website works 100% of the time. But that's probably naive. Like, that's unrealistic. Because you're human, you might screw up and you might break the website or app. Uh, the power might go out. There might be a natural disaster. Like 100% uptime, honestly, over the course of a day, a year, a decade, is just not going to happen. Too many things go wrong in the real world. So how can we go about measuring this? Well, Brian, do you mind pulling up your screen and showing us what it would mean for a website or a mobile application to be up 99% of the time? 
So you should see here on Brian's screen, he's kindly calculated using this free website online what it means for your website to be up 99% of the time. Frankly, I'm pretty happy with the idea of 99%. It's not 100%, but wow, 99% feels like it's almost all the time. But not really, because notice on this web page, if your website or your mobile application only works 99% of the time, which is almost as good as 100%, that means that daily your application or website might be broken for 14 minutes. Every week it might be down for over an hour and 40 minutes. Every month it's going to be down for seven hours. And yearly, your application or website might be down for three or more days. So even though 99% in almost any context sounds great, being down 1% of the time, when you think about how many seconds are in a day, how many days are in a year, that actually does add up. So we seem to have a problem here. Like it's not sufficient just to uh, assume that your website will be up all the time, you want to increase this probability. And so humans have adopted this convention of describing their uptime in terms of nines. This is two nines. If your website or your application has two nines of uptime, that means you're up 99% of the time. But what would be better than two nines? Maybe three nines. So Brian, can you give us a third nine? Suppose we're up 99.9% .9 of the time. That sounds amazing. I mean, honestly, you can round up at that point and it feels like 100, but that still means you're going to be down a minute out of the day, 10 minutes out of the week, 43 minutes every month, and eight hours every year. Now, honestly, for your own personal homepage and mine, probably not a big deal. Maybe even for CS50's website, probably not a huge deal since people have to sleep at some point. But if you have users all around the world, I can tell you anytime something goes wrong with CS50's IDE, even for a minute and 26 seconds, Kareem and I and the team start getting emails very quickly. So users notice. So let me ask a question of the audience. Um, Brian, go ahead and stop sharing for just a moment. How can we increase the number of nines? What would it take to go from two nines to three nines, or you know what, better yet, what would it take to go from three nines to like five nines? And five nines is kind of the, the gold standard in IT. If you're up five nines, people are impressed and they rather expect that of services today. How can you increase these numbers of nines using the primitives of today's discussion thus far? Uh, Martin, do you want to say hi and where you're from? Hi, I'm from Seattle, Washington. Um, I just think it takes an increase in redundancy, um, having servers in multiple locations all over the country or the world, and making sure that uh, if one goes down, I can tell the other servers that it's down and then it could take over, and possibly having multiple containers that are running the same app so you can have one container switch to the other container if it runs out of time. Exactly. Really well said. In order to achieve more nines, you really need more redundancy. You need to continue to apply all of today's principles again and again. And you know what? Not just in the same server room or uh, data center. You know what? What would be better than having all of your servers here in Cambridge, Massachusetts? Well, you know what? We should probably pay for some servers in California or in another continent of the world because things happen. There might be a, a hurricane on the east coast of the United States that might take down all three or four of our servers. So what's better than that? Let's have another location. But oh gosh, we're starting to go down a real rabbit's hole here, so to speak, whereby now if you have two different locations, imagine how long those cables need to be, so to speak, or how you have to now solve problems of transmitting data across different states, across different countries, across different oceans in some cases. So there's some non-trivial problems there. And then there's the issue of security. You might be comfortable having all of your servers in your own closet or in a data center that only you have access to, but when you start using using the cloud, that is other people's servers, now you are subject to maybe those people somehow accessing your servers and in turn accessing your data. So there's trust necessarily involved. So there too is a trade-off. You might not love the idea of crawling around on the floor plugging in all those cables yourself. You might not want to or even know how to solve load balancing yourself. So it's appealing to use the cloud and someone else's servers. But now there's a whole bunch of potential adversaries who have more physical access to your servers that you're renting now than you yourself do. So let me ask you a question, Brian, if you could pull up the poll question. Is the cloud secure? In our final moments together, let's ask just one or two final questions. Do you think the cloud is secure? Brian, want to go ahead and conduct this poll? All right, it looks like we're about 87%, and we'll go ahead and end the poll now. 
And it looks like 39% of us say, yes, the cloud is secure. 35% say, no, the cloud is not secure. And 26% are unsure. Really interesting split, and I'm a little worried that so many of you don't feel it's secure because, because frankly, I think I'm in that bucket too, but it's here too. It depends. And this, again, is so thematic in computing that of trade-offs, right? If you are among the 30 plus percent of folks who think it's, it's not secure, that's fine. You don't have to use the cloud per se, at least not to run your own website or your own mobile application per se. You can just run all the servers yourself. But is which is the worst evil? The complexity that you're taking on, the technical savvy that you need, the money you might need to pay someone local who knows how to run all of these servers or who enjoys running all of these servers? What happens if your own server goes down, your office loses power, you need availability elsewhere? So at some point, you have to pick the evil that you're most comfortable with. Are you most concerned about scalability? Are you most concerned about availability? Are you most secure, concerned? about security. And all of these different primitives are important and it might depend on your business. So for instance, for many years, it was very difficult, if not possible, for certain industries in the world to use cloud computing years ago early on when it was a very new thing. For instance, healthcare applications, financial applications, and other particularly sensitive businesses around which there are a lot of laws and regulations as to how that data needs to be protected. They couldn't use Amazon or Google or Microsoft. They had to do everything in-house. Nowadays, there have been new technologies, new policies, new uh, legal contracts put into place that make this more possible, but they too are taking a potential risk by exposing their data to more people. But I would consider this. You might think that your own server or servers are more secure in your own office or your own basement or your own data center. But are you in your office all the time? Maybe you're only there 9 to 5, which means for 16 hours a day, who knows who could physically access your servers? Meanwhile, are you an expert in security? Can you afford to pay someone who's an expert in security? Or would it maybe be a net positive, not an absolute positive, but a net positive to just outsource that to the cloud? Let Amazon or Google or Microsoft or others hire and train those people, allow them to amortize the cost of those humans over your rented servers and many other customers so that you're not paying for a full-time employee to focus on these servers for you. You're just paying for a fraction of their time, but a fraction of an expert's time. And so there, too, there's always a trade-off. And there's so many more rabbit holes we could go down. Encryption is just one of them. But for more on that, let me refer you back to CS50X itself if you've not taken. Even if you don't trust who is running your servers, you can at least trust math in many ways, such that if you encrypt your data on these services, at least then it doesn't matter if someone has physical access, if only you have the secret key, so to speak via which to decrypt that data. But that's easier said than done, because encryption might slow things down. If you lose the key, you might lose all of your data. So again there, if you take nothing else away from today, do appreciate that in IT, trade-offs are constant and omnipresent. And this is true in CS50 at the software level. This is true in CS50's other courses at the hardware and conceptual level. So indeed, if you would like to learn more about these topics, allow me to encourage you to visit CS50's um, Computer Science for Business Professionals, which is a non-programming class that's more concept-oriented, whereas CS50X itself is sort of bottom-up, where you do everything yourself hands-on. CS50B, for business, so to speak, is more of a top-down class, focused on uh, uh, concepts and discussions thereof. If you'd like to learn more about what we began to introduce you today in cloud computing, um, do take a look at either of those courses there. But we're just over our allotted time, and we're so glad everyone joined us today. We already took a photo of you all waving, but if I could, I have three very large screens of you in front of me. If you wouldn't mind if I took a photograph of you waving, and we'll be sure to post this online later. Thank you so much for joining us. We will follow up with email about future events. Have a wonderful morning, afternoon, or evening. This was CS50.